Welcome back to the channel and to our very unique Volkswagen diesel powered Chevy S10 truck project. Today we're going to take a step backwards and have a second look at the fuel economy this truck gets. In a previous episode, our first attempt at measuring the fuel economy resulted in getting a very reasonable 32.5 miles to the US gallon. I feel like that's probably right on target. However, since then, I've tried adjusting the timing on the injector pump and we may have discovered a new problem. I think today we're not going to be getting into the injector pump issues and instead, we're going to go ahead and install one more gauge in the truck. This time around, we'll be installing an exhaust gas temperature gauge. The exhaust gas temperature gauge that I'm using is pretty much plug and play and all we really need to do is drill a hole in the exhaust for the thermocouple sensor. So I'm just going to go ahead and ramble on about stuff and in the background you can watch the process. So an EGT gauge really shouldn't be necessary at this point in the project because we haven't bolted on a turbocharger yet. Actually, when we do install a turbo, we'll need to swap in a turbo injector pump. However, right now, we're still experimenting with the limits of the non-turbo engine. Anyway, despite not having a turbo, an EGT gauge will come in handy when we try some modifications to the non-turbo injector pump. It'll all make sense in future episodes. And as a bonus, we may be able to use the EGT gauge to enhance the fuel economy. Now on modern gasoline powered cars, there's usually some sort of gizmo on the dashboard that provides instantaneous readouts for the fuel economy. I suspect on modern diesels with common rail injection, there may also be such a gizmo. Now on an old school diesel with mechanical injection, well, there's no feedback from the engine to indicate if the engine's operating efficiently. On a diesel, you can't fit a vacuum gauge, and that's because diesels don't make vacuum in the intake manifold. Now, on my other Chevy S10 that's equipped with a 4.3 liter gasoline engine and a 700R4 automatic transmission, I have a vacuum gauge installed on the dashboard. The vacuum gauge is a trick that old timers used back in the day, and the goal is to operate the vehicle while maintaining the highest amount of vacuum in the intake manifold. If the engine's properly tuned, this will result in the best fuel economy. Now, on this truck, I don't necessarily care about the fuel economy, and I use the vacuum gauge when I'm pulling a trailer. For instance, a load like this requires downshifting the transmission from overdrive, and it's good to keep an eye on the vacuum gauge to monitor the load on the engine. I think most people don't care, but in order to keep an engine and transmission happy on an older vehicle, it's best not to put too much stress on the drivetrain. Anyway, on a diesel-powered vehicle, the only real indicator that you can use is the temperature of the exhaust. A hot exhaust indicates the engine's under a load, and a cooler exhaust indicates the engine's under a lighter load. So, having a gauge to measure the exhaust gas temperatures will provide me with some feedback. It's sort of like having a vacuum gauge on a gasoline engine. Now, diesels naturally run very, very lean, and the exhaust tends to run cold until you put a load on the engine. So, keeping an eye on the EGT gauge may help with the fuel economy. The hotter the exhaust, well, the more fuel that's being consumed. The gauge package came with this plastic pod doohickey. Now, I'm really not sure how they expect the gauge to stay in the pod, and it seems like these two items were never meant to be used together. I feel like using this pod would be pretty much pointless. Now, on the dashboard of the truck, I've already filled in this area with gauges, so there's no more room. Now, this area is reserved for the HVAC controls, and as you can see, I haven't bothered to install any of that stuff yet. It turns out with all the stuff disconnected, the heater still works fine, and all I need to do is connect power to the blower motor, and the cabin of the truck gets toasty warm. So yeah, this is the HVAC control head, and while it has a bunch of doohickeys and whatchamacallits on it, I feel like it's not really necessary. Whatever random settings the HVAC system is set to right now seems to be fine. Basically, by connecting this wire I get heat, and disconnecting the wire I get no heat. It's sort of caveman style, but it works and it's simple. So we really don't need this thingy. Off camera, I went ahead and 3D printed something that we can use to fill in the area that HVAC control head resides. And as you can see, we now have a place to mount the EGT gauge. This will put the gauge in a nice place. Of course, we also have an extra hole for yet another gauge, and sometime soon we'll be filling that hole with a boost gauge. 
So this thing is printed with PLA plastic, which is a decent plastic for prototyping. However, PLA is not stable for parts subjected to high temperatures, and this thing is going to melt in the summertime temperatures. But keep in mind, it's winter right now, and for now we're just going to use this as is. I'll print a revised part in ABS plastic in the next couple of weeks, but this should be fine for today. Fast forward a few minutes and the panel's installed. Eh, it looks like I need to modify the design for a better fit, but I have to say this isn't bad for the first attempt. You know, this is a very complex shape and it was designed using Tinkercad. Now, Tinkercad is a free online resource for folks who don't know how to use a real CAD program. It's free with no strings attached, and I like free. Right now, the outside temperature is hovering around 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I've already taken the truck out and driven it around town for 10 minutes to warm everything up. And now, I have to pull the truck into the shop and prepare it for the fuel economy run, which usually takes about a half hour to drain the fuel and weigh it and put the fuel back in the tank. I covered how all this is done in a previous episode. Anyway, once the truck is prepped, we'll be ready to head out. So right now the temperature's gone up a bit and it's 46 degrees Fahrenheit. We have some winds coming out from the south at 10 to 20 miles per hour, so we do have some wind, but it's not too bad today. Now in the previous fuel economy test, we were seeing stronger winds out of the north. However, the way the route is set up, the headwinds and the tailwinds should sort of cancel each other out. And that's because we spend an equal amount of time going in each direction. Eh, at least that's the theory. So the route that we use and how we measure the fuel that's being consumed was covered in a previous episode. If you haven't seen that already, check it out. Right now we have a tailwind and that's helping push this pig forward. The exhaust gas temperatures are hovering around 650 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the tailwind is helping to lessen the load on the engine, but in a little while we'll have a headwind and that'll increase the load on the engine. Anyway, on this engine, the hotter the exhaust gas temperature, the more the load the engine's under. And the cooler the temperatures, the lighter the load. Today, I'm just observing the gauge and I'm not using it to my advantage. Okay, on the map, we're heading in this direction. Now we have the wind to the right of the truck or a side wind. At this point, I'm seeing a rise in the exhaust gas temperatures and now we're about 100 degrees hotter and the gauge is reading about 750 degrees. Now, I'm driving the truck like I would normally do and I'm not doing anything special to help improve the fuel economy. However, my driving style has changed slightly since the last fuel economy run. You see, today I'm running the engine up to 3000 RPM before shifting gears. Now previously, I'm not really sure where my shift points were and that's because I didn't have the tachometer installed yet. But now, I'm definitely getting a better feel for how this engine behaves and shifting at 3000 RPM seems to be the way to go for normal driving. You know, there just doesn't seem to be any advantage to shift before 3000 RPM. The engine's not really happy when you short shift it. Okay, now we have a headwind from the south adding some resistance and the engine's working a bit harder. So the exhaust gas temperatures are bouncing between the high 800s and into the low 900s. Very interesting. It would appear that the headwinds and the tailwinds don't actually cancel each other out just by doing some quick math. If we use the exhaust gas temperatures as a load indicator and then take a look at this map. Over here with the tailwind, we saw the temperatures in the 650 degree range. On this road, with the wind buffeting the side of the truck, we saw temperatures in the 750 range. Now, heading directly into the wind, we see the temperatures closer to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's because I have to give the engine a little bit more throttle, thus more fuel in order to maintain 55 miles per hour. The good news is, the engine doesn't seem to have a problem maintaining this speed. Now, off camera, I've been having a battle trying to get the injector pump timed correctly. The procedure is simple enough, but once I get the pump timed as per the instructions, well, the engine is hard starting and it's down on power. So instead of doing it by the book, I've been manually advancing the pump to an unknown position, and the only feedback that I'm using is how fast the engine will start. You know, I'd really love to have some sort of number that I could jot down for my records, but it's not easy to do that. You see, in order to put the dial indicator on the pump to measure the plunger height, well, I have to disassemble a lot of stuff. Stuff. Now all this junk you see is what I have to remove in order to set the injector timing. Once the timing's set, then I have to put all this stuff back on the engine to test it. So for the second time in a row, the engine just wasn't happy when it was set to the specs in the service manual. 
But here's the kicker. The engine wanted more advanced just to be happy. At this point, it's hard to say where the pump is set to, but like I showed you before, we'd have to take all this junk off the engine just to find out. Another thing I notice when I'm setting up the pump timing is, if I pull the cold start lever, I don't see any movement on the dial indicator. In theory, pulling on the cold start lever should show movement on the dial indicator, and we have nothing. The engine runs great, but I think the injector pump may be a bit dodgy, and it needs to be disassembled and inspected on the bench. That's probably going to happen next week. I suspect the advanced mechanism inside the pump may be sticking or faulty. It's hard to say without having a good look at it. I have to admit, the truck is running and driving a lot better today than it was in the previous fuel economy run, and that may be a result of me fiddling with the injector pump off camera. Even though the engine runs great, I want to take the time to inspect the injector pump, and that's because the pump needs to work perfectly in order to try some modifications to it. So obviously this is a truck, and we need to do some testing while it's doing truck things. I figure at some point we'll do a payload test, and perhaps 500 pounds in the bed would be, eh, realistic I guess. I also want to try to pull a 1500 pound trailer just for fun. Of course we'll do acceleration performance testing and fuel economy testing with the loads. And we're done. All right, well, this is very interesting. Today we traveled a total of 66.9 miles, pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. There were a few stops, so it wasn't just constant driving. Anyway, the truck consumed 5,450 grams of diesel fuel, which works out to be 1.69 US gallons. And after a bit of math, we calculated the fuel consumption to be 39.58 miles to the US gallon. So that's quite an improvement for not really doing anything that I know of. The timing of the injector pump was definitely changed, however since the pump is still acting goofy, we don't know how close we are to being within factory specs. All I really know is, the current pump timing allows the engine to start without much drama at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Any colder than that, then the engine definitely puts up a bit of a fight. We had winds today, which is normal for Kansas, and the truck spent an equal amount of time in all directions. It's interesting that today we saw an improvement in fuel economy, and if I had to guess, I'd have to say it was directly related to the injector pump timing. Now, the exhaust gas temperature gauge should help me drive this thing more efficiently. Today, I observed the gauge and I didn't really use it to my advantage. However, a few times I did try to back off on the accelerator in order to reduce the EGTs, but in those instances, backing off on the accelerator slightly also reduced the speed of the truck, and the point of this test is to maintain 55 miles per hour. So it's pretty clear that the little engine doesn't have any reserve power and throttling back slightly is a speed penalty. Now, some people may say, duh, what did you expect? Well, don't be so quick to judge. You see, on the Kubota turbo diesel Honda, the little 20 horsepower engine can maintain speed when backing off on the accelerator a little bit. Of course, that car is a lot more aerodynamic. Anyway, on the truck, the aerodynamics are not as favorable and lifting off on the accelerator slightly will immediately cause the truck to slow down which may seem like common sense. So to the folks who hypermile, well, there's no buffer zone on this vehicle, and in order to maintain a set speed, you won't be able to dance with the accelerator. All right, well, let's move on to something else. The goal of this project was to build a fuel-efficient, basic, no-frills pickup truck. This 1989 Chevy pickup truck has zero options from when it was purchased new, and that means no power steering, no air conditioning, and roll-up windows. Just a basic truck. Given the fact that modern trucks are huge and weigh many tons, I figured it was time to head over to the local grain elevator and have this truck weighed. Well, I think we did all right. This truck is missing a few interior parts that we'll have to add at some point in the future. But right now, it tips the scale at 2,520 pounds. Figure it's going to weigh about 2,550 when we add the carpeting and the door panels. Now, out of curiosity, I had my other Chevy S10 weighed. This pickup truck is more or less a basic truck. However, it does have air conditioning and power steering, plus a heavy cast iron 4.3 liter V6 engine and an automatic transmission. Oh, and the bed is a bit longer, but it's still an 89 Chevy S10. Anyway, this truck tips the scale at 3,120 pounds, so it's close to 600 pounds heavier than the diesel truck, but it can also do a lot more work. 
Now, I've never driven this truck on the fuel economy course, and that's because it's just a tool in my toolbox. However, when I do fill the tank, I check the fuel economy, and this truck averages 15 miles per gallon on a tank of fuel, which ain't bad when you consider whenever it's driven, it's usually doing some kind of purposeful work. I really like this truck, despite the fact that it has an automatic transmission, and in my world, this is pretty much a Cadillac. Now, today's fuel economy test showed that the truck is capable of improvement and it may be possible to tweak a few things and perhaps increase the fuel economy a little bit more. This channel is focused on engines and engine modifications, so the improvements will also focus on the engine. The good news is the used and very questionable injector pump that we purchased has finally arrived and before we dig into the pump that's on the engine, we'll practice a little bit on this pump and we're going to take a deep dive into the advanced mechanism inside the pump. Now, once I fully understand how it all fits together, then I'll apply my newly found knowledge to the pump that's on the engine. Eh, these Bosch rotary injector pumps are really simple and I reckon we'll find out if that's true or not. Bruh. So I'll bet a box of donuts that this ugly new addition to the interior triggered a few people. It looks crappy in the videos and I'll admit that, but in my defense I did mention it was a prototype. So obviously it's the wrong color and that can be forgiven because this is the only color I had in stock. Now the edges on this are sharp and unfinished and the goal was to design and print something that would fit in the oddly shaped space on the instrument panel. So I didn't bother to round over the edges in the first design. I would call this a work in progress and in the real world it takes a few prototypes before a design is finalized. Now, this is the second attempt and on this version all the fitment issues have been resolved. The edges have been rounded over and it's close to the final version. Now this hole here is for the push button heater. You see connecting the wire under the hood to get the heater to work is barbaric and I'm a lot more civilized in real life. So we plan on putting a push button here and that'll turn the heater on when heat is necessary and pushing the button again will turn the heater off when it gets too hot inside the cabin. This is a fully digital climate control system that I've designed and one button does it all. It's simple and there's no reason to have complex gizmos that you need to adjust. Nope, heat on and heat off and that's the way it should be. But it's still work in progress. Well, I hope you found this video to be entertaining and we have much more on the way. We'll see you next time. Until then.